There's one place for all space, the Annual Space Symposium. This premier assembly of space leaders from more than 40 countries represent commercial, government, military, research and investment communities, and you can be a part of it. With newsmaking panels, presentations, exhibits, and networking opportunities, Space Symposium participants are able to inform, engage, and connect with one another. Join us and explore our world-renowned Annual Space Symposium. I'm Thomas Strong with Space Foundation, and welcome to another episode of Space Matters. We developed this series to bring you an open and candid discussion with our panel of space policy experts on emerging issues and trends across the space community. But before we get to our normal roundtable, we're fortunate to start with a conversation with our special guest, General Retired Les Lyles, Chairman of the National Space Council's Users Advisory Group. The UAG, as it's known, has the mission to ensure that the interests of industries and other non-federal entities involved in space activities, including in particular commercial entities, are adequately represented in the National Space Council. Just recently, the new membership of the UAG, led by General Lyles, held their first meeting and discussed a wide variety of priorities. Here to discuss the UAG's mission is General Lyles. Sir, welcome to our program. Uh, Thomas, thank you very much. Uh, it is an honor to be part of this Space Foundation broadcast. Uh, and I can't tell you how personally, how much I really admire what Space Foundation does. And very, very glad to do, that you've established this uh, program with Space Matters. This kind of informal discussion, I think, is very, very important. So thank you very, very much. So sure, thank you for those notes. And we generally appreciate your time. So let me let me kick it off. Uh, you know, you've been a member of the UAG. It was established uh, under the last administration. You were a member there. You were recently uh, appointed by the Vice President Kamala Harris uh, to the National Space Council to chair it. Um, and just a couple of weeks ago, you had your inaugural meeting for this UAG with its new members. Can you give us some insights on your view of the purpose of the UAG, how it's currently formed, and some of its goals and priorities? Uh, yes, Thomas. When I think about the purpose of the UAG, it's really uh, as the name states, it's an advisory group to the National Space Council uh, with representation of users of the space enterprise for our country from everywhere, every domain, from civil space, commercial space, national security space, intelligence space, and the broad aspects that relate to space, like education and science and technology and obviously our economy. So the establishment of the users advisory group under the last administration to me was a major, major uh, positive step. Uh, as you all know, uh, and perhaps many others, the National Space Council itself has really been in existence since 1958. Uh, not every administration has utilized uh, this particular body, uh, but it was reestablished under the last administration in 2017 uh, and existed uh, uh, for about four or five years uh, before we then switched to the, the current uh, administration. And I'm very, very happy that they have really blessed the use of the user's uh, advisor group as part of the National Space Council process. So uh, on that, and you talked about kind of the ver diverse uh, kind of spectrum that it scans, both national security and economic issues and others. And, and I've noticed that it's it's well balanced with uh, faces and, and diversity of, of both thought and leadership on the council. Some from uh, uh, the previous UAG, some new members. C can you tell us more about kind of your perspective of the makeup and the contribution that they bring? Well, I'm a big believer in diversity in everything that we do in our nation, but particularly things like a major enterprise, economic enterprise, technical enterprise like space uh, for the United States. Uh, and the idea of having such a body and not representing every different spectrum, if you will, that could be part of it just didn't really make sense. And this administration really believes in that. So uh, relative to corporations and entities, they didn't want to have just big space, if I can use that term. They wanted small space, a so new space organizations to be part of it. So the representation of the user advisory group sort of covers that spectrum. 
We wanted to make sure that we were looking at every different aspect relative to, to uh, education. So there are historical black colleges who are represented. There are major institutions that are represented, minority serving institutes, uh, and you know everything that we can touch relative to that standpoint. And so to, to me, uh, if you're going to look at the space enterprise for the United States and ensure that it is and can continues to be the best it can be in the world, you really need to make sure that everybody's involved. As I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I think it was the 23rd of February, um, you had your inaugural meeting for the UAG under the Biden-Harris administration. And we're able to hear expert testimony from a variety of government officials, former government officials. Um, could you share with us your thoughts following that meeting, kind of the perspective that you hear and kind of what the, the path is that you're charting to accomplish some of those priorities going forward? Well, sort of twofold, if you will. Uh, we That was our first formal meeting, obviously, in person uh, for the UAG. This was our first opportunity to really get together and to listen uh, to expertise, uh, both uh, present and past, uh, that represented the different aspects of the space enterprise. We obviously had civil space represented by the NASA Deputy Administrator, Pam Melroy. Uh, we actually started, if you listen to the, that particular presentation, with a salute, if you will, from uh, Buzz Aldrin that we had to, uh, that we taped and presented. Uh, we had uh, national security space represented by General D.T. Thompson, the Deputy Chief of Space Operations at Space Force. We had um, representatives from the Department of Commerce looking at economic aspect. And we had then Dr. Tom Zabrukin, the former science director at NASA, to talk about uh, technology. So uh, I was very pleased that we had that opportunity for all of us and anybody who listened in to get the sort of perspective on what's important to those different dimensions uh, of our space enterprise. And we as a body will take that information plus everything we're doing in our subcommittees to really charge to make sure that we are literally addressing everything that needs to be looked at, needs to be examined, needs to be studied in some cases to ensure we have the best space enterprise in, in the world. On that note, can you tell us kind of the process going forward? So they, I think you certainly brought out some of the large priorities that you want to tackle. You talked about there will be some subcommittee meetings. How does that move forward to generate both the discussion that happens from this rich group of diverse participants into policy? Thomas, let me uh, start by, for those who are not familiar, uh, discussing the six subcommittees that have been established by the Space Council for this particular user advisory group. We have an economic development and industrial-based subcommittee, which sort of speaks for itself in terms of its, its name, looking at uh, the economic development activities across the nation for space enterprise and ensuring that the industrial base writ large has an opportunity to be involved in it. Not just big space companies, but small companies, I'll even use the term mom and pop shops, where anybody should be involved in the enterprise. We have an exploration and discovery subcommittee whose focus is specifically on civil space and looking at things like the Artemis program, the lunar to Mars architecture, et cetera, and making sure that also is very broad and uh, diverse, if you will, and how it, things are going along there. The national security subcommittee, which I chair for this particular group, uh, is gonna be looking specifically at the needs of national security space enterprise, national security and intelligence, and as you may have heard uh, General D.T. Thompson, uh, the Deputy Chief of Space Operations say on the 23rd, looking specifically at how commercial and civil space endeavors can help support our national security needs. We have a STEM education, diversity and uh, education, inclusion and outreach subcommittee, which again sort of speaks for itself and looking at the real broad issue and very important one of uh, its STEM really being broadly uh, both supported uh, and taken advantage of relative to our space needs for our country. We have a climate and societal benefits uh, subcommittee, and I'm very happy that Vice President Kamala Harris has really put emphasis on this. Climate change, uh, everything associated with that is a major endeavor. Obviously, space plays a major role. But we've also asked that subcommittee to look at other societal benefits. How can space and space enterprise support other societal needs that we have, both in the states and in the world? And then finally, but certainly not least, we have a data and emerging technology subcommittee looking at the broad challenges of all the data that's available 
uh, both in terms of data analytics, but how do you harness that data to make wise decisions relative to our space enterprise? And then me as a technologist and engineer, very happy that we're also charged with looking at emerging technologies. Are we ensuring that new technologies, not just the standard ones, and I don't mean that literally, if you will, but are new technologies being harnessed to help support our space enterprise? So that's the focus. Those are the things that we're going to be charging and looking at in the user advisory group. And every one of those subcommittees will be working together in some cases, working alone, but we'll bring back a compendium of all of those to make uh, recommendations for policy or other changes to the Space Council. So I appreciate your time this morning. Before we go, is there any any other last words or, or any other uh, comments you'd like to provide for, for our viewers? Yes, uh, and thanks, Thomas, for that opportunity. You know, when you look at the purpose of having both the National Space Council to really harmonize, coordinate, and leverage all the different pieces of the space enterprise for our country, and then the user advisory group role to support that, uh, I tell everybody in every opportunity I can, we're looking to make sure that everybody's involved. So I happen to also chair NASA's advisory council for uh, Senator Nelson and looking at specific things just related to NASA. But even there, we're always looking to make sure that everybody is involved. So I, I will tell people here, uh, when I get a chance, hopefully to participate in the space symposium, I'll tell everybody that we want their inputs. We want their ideas. We want even thoughts on, are we looking at the right kinds of things? And then uh, as a technologist, I'm quick to point out to people, technology does not necessarily have to be hardware. When you're thinking of innovation and technology, it could be a change in the way you do processes and build things. And so uh, we, we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to get everybody involved to have the best space enterprise in the United States that we ever could possibly have. Yeah, I, I'm going to I appreciate those remarks. And I agree. I mean, our voices are, are we've got such a great community. And our voices are stronger together. So I think that's a that's a great note for everybody out there. Sir, I want to thank you. Thank you for your time today. Uh, um, thank you for your leadership on, on the National Space Council, the UAG. And, and thank you for your service and, your, and what you do to help improve our nation in many ways. Thank you, Thomas. And the, thank you and everybody at Space Foundation for all that you do. Now let's turn to our panel to discuss General Lyle's comments and other initiatives of the UAG. Joining us today, the Honorable Bob Walker, former Congressman and founder and CEO of Moonwalker Associates, Carissa Christensen, CEO and founder of Bryce Tech, and Patricia Cooper, president and founder of Constellation Advisory. Now let me invite our panel to take the stage and Bob Walker, if I can send it over to you to get us started. Well, thanks, Thomas, um, and uh, welcome to uh, everyone. We're uh, delighted to be back with Space Matters. We're missing one of our panelists that's usually with us, uh, the former administrator of NASA, uh, Jim Bridenstine, uh, couldn't be with us, but we'll try to carry on and uh, talk about uh, some of the things that came out of the UAG meeting. The UAG meeting is the advisory committee uh, to the National Space Council. And uh, General Lyles uh, has given you um, a uh, little bit of a preview uh, at the beginning of this show. Uh, we'll talk about some of those things and uh, uh, hopefully give you some insight as to what all of that means uh, going forward. Uh, I was interested in what uh, Les had to say um, in large part because he's formulating what uh, the UAG is going to look like uh, over the next uh, couple of years. And it's what's very clear is that they have formed a group of subcommittees that reflects more narrowly uh, what this administration regards as its priorities in space, and then is looking for input from the industry and from elsewhere uh, to that uh, particular uh, set of uh, principles. So I personally thought that uh, uh, some of the uh, areas in which they were going to go into uh, are new areas and uh, could be uh, quite interesting. I also thought that uh, it's important to realize that the job of the National Space Council is to make certain that we are coordinating all these various things in government. And so there are a lot of topics here that the coordination role is going to become uh, even more important for the National Space Council. Uh, but let me turn now to um, uh, the other panelists. 
uh, and get your views of uh, what the UAG meeting did and where we go from the future. Patricia, let me start with you. Well, thank you, Bob. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be back here after missing the last one. And it was uh, great uh, to have General Lyles frame the UAG, you, you know, for, uh, uh, he was right to note that for a number of years, the UAG hadn't really been accessed. And now they've got uh, sort of a little bit of a role going. I think only five or six of the um, members from the last user's advisory group have been retained. And those tend to be the leaders of the traditional bulwark of the um, aerospace community. I was interested to see the mix really towards a truer user representation. We've got um, agriculture represented, you know, weather and climate change. I think that's a really interesting expression of how the government is appreciating the, the impact of space on actual our actual society and our economy. Um, there's an enormous amount of talent on this, uh, on this new UAG. Um, and I think one of the challenges is going to be to tap that, harness it in some useful way uh, to give advice on policy and, uh, and, and practices that the government can actually implement within the, the remaining term. So that, that is a challenge. I like the new mix. I uh, am glad they got going. It takes a lot of bureaucratic energy to put together something like this. Uh, so now let's see if they can uh, get off to the races. Uh, Carissa, let's uh, kick it to you to uh, get your thoughts. Thank you, Bob. I agree with, uh, with both of you that it is good to see uh, the UAG back in force. Uh, I also agree that uh, it, it is not, you know, the UAG is not the sole focus of the Space Council, and uh, there's certainly an interesting conversation to be had uh, uh, there, tar looking specifically at the UAG. Some of the changes uh, are, are, to me, emblematic and well aligned with the challenges that, that we as a nation and we as a, a world face uh, uh, in thinking about how to effectively use the space enterprise. Uh, one no that I'll note is the, of course, the inclusion of a, a subcommittee on climate change and the benefits of space. And I do think that uh, there's a, an awareness um, a gap with regard to the role of space in understanding changes in climate, in evaluating the effectiveness of measures to address climate change, uh, in managing uh, climate impacts and um, uh, uh, weather phenomena, uh, severe weather phenomena. So how does a user advisory group help with that? In one way, um, a, a unified uh, a administration and industry position Unified is perhaps too strong. <laughs> a shared uh, industry and um, uh, administration conversation around some of these priorities, I think, is very helpful to international partners who are seeking to align their legislative and political and industrial actors. And um, so uh, the UAG can help escalate those issues, uh, improve visibility, and improve understanding. I think we need to be realistic about what an advisory group can do and cannot do. And I do think that messaging is, is an important benefit. Another interesting element uh, to me of this new composition is the inclusion of an ethicist as a member of the user advisory group uh, for space. And I think that's particularly relevant for certainly for climate issues, as well as for uh, AI and machine learning uh, applications, which are enormously relevant to any number of space activities, including exploration and um, uh, in space manufacturing and um, uh, even, even some uh, robotic exploration. So interesting new composition, uh, still hitting the, the mainstream topics and um, uh, agree that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's good to have it in, in place. Yeah, I think both, both of you have made an important point here that uh, the UAG is servicing the National Space Council. I mean, these are subcommittees de designed to uh, talk about uh, subject matters that the Space Council should take an, an interest in. And that's, uh, that's an important distinction because at the end of the day, the Space Council is supposed to play a coordination role 
across across government. And my um, concern is that as a lot of things are blossoming in space, that we're going to uh, need a lot more in the way of understanding of all the various uh, pieces in this. Um, for, ex for example, uh, there are a lot of people using commercial space assets these days uh, that uh, in the past uh, depended almost exclusively on prime contractors. And so um, uh, we are finding now uh, new uh, aspects uh, to the whole space coordination uh, aspect. And uh, I think we're going to uh, uh, need uh, the input of this group to tell the Space Council where it ought to place uh, some priorities as it goes out to the uh, departments and agencies. So, um, uh, Chris, any comments on that? Absolutely. The commercial space, uh, th th there's always an instantiation of commercial space that's challenging the policy environment. And there has been for the last three decades in various forms, whether it is uh, you, you, it used to be, shall we let commercial rockets use national launch uh, uh, facilities? And we've we've been through a, a many different waves of challenges. And the current one is, how do we integrate effectively as, you know, how does the government integrate effectively as stewards of national taxpayers' uh, resources, venture-funded commercial space firms, which are operate very differently from prime contractors that are designed specifically to serve government customers and to be aligned with government processes and requirements. And venture funded firms, we've seen about 500 of them uh, pop up globally since about 2015. Um, they operate very differently in that they are uh, much more risk tolerant, typically. Uh, they are, uh, arguably uh, more agile and um, uh, typically more targeted in the product or service that they're offering than a major um, prime contractor. And that creates a wide array of challenges from sim the simple mechanics of acquisition. How does a smaller company or a company that was not, uh, that, that was not built to accommodate government acquisition processes and timelines, how does it plug in to those processes? And multiple agencies have made efforts to adapt uh, through to how do you evaluate the risk that a company that you're building, that you're relying on for a mission critical uh, component or service, how do you evaluate the risk that that company will be out of business or switch its business model in a year or five years? Uh, and we've, we've spoken about this before. To me, this could be a very powerful conversation for the UAG to have because the correct answer, again, from the point of view of the government being a steward of taxpayer resources, is not to uh, step away from that risk because that means the government is not leveraging uh, investment in innovation that could be quite valuable in terms of speed or, or um, uh, quality and capability but to adapt our approach to contracting to explicitly and systematically evaluate that risk and build in contracting mechanisms that enable the government to continue to acquire what, it's need, what it needs, even in the event of business shifts or, or failures. And it's a very different approach to contracting than we've seen, seen previously. I would love to see that emerge on the agenda. Yeah, Patricia, I must say that um, uh, I was stunned the other day, and it, it, it what stuns is not the right word, but just with uh, your interest in the commercial space world, to see SpaceX given the chance to launch multi-billion dollar satellite uh, to the, from the NRO. I mean, <laughs> this is something that no one would have imagined even 10 years ago. That's absolutely true. I think we've moved beyond thinking about the role of commercial as sort of a structured uh, public-private partnership only or in some sort of procurement um, format to a more diffused, um, uh, modern, it, it sort of trusted role in the space ecosystem. It's striking. I was looking at the membership of the, of the uh, UAG and saw that uh, uh, Simon Proctor, who was 
the pilot of the private astronaut mission for Inspiration4 is, is on this committee. That is, a, that is a striking thing to have a fully commercial, fully commercial, fully private uh, uh, space exploration venture be represented now in this forum. That is a, a, a nod to a different direction. Um, I do think uh, the UAG is lucky to have General Lyles, who had been a member of it in the last iteration. He has a good, uh, I think, uh, ability to uh, gauge when this group can be tapped for an important question and when they can, when maybe their uh, voice would be best utilized. I was thinking uh, one of the, um, one of the questions that has to come up after uh, the Silicon Valley Bank episode of last week is what kind of dependency should the government be considering, aware of, um, apprised of, um, beyond the traditional uh, supply chain uh, vulnerabilities as other kinds of companies and interactions uh, kind of enter, filter into the space sector. And this seems like a group that could add some knowledge to that. I don't know whether that will be a, a formal product of this group. Well, that's an interesting point. It's one I hadn't thought about uh, when I saw the problem with the uh, uh, SV the bank. Uh, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it really does raise some uh, questions about uh, what the financing underpinnings are of uh, some of the companies we've come to. Uh, to rely upon. Uh, Carissa, what, what about that? Uh, so uh, certainly uh, we've seen that uh, uh, some uh, major depositors in SVB or space companies. In addition, one of the really critical points is, so this is an institution that is, um, was the go-to banking institution, the go-to financial institution for many, many startups. I talked to one fund uh, uh, founder who said three quarters of his portfolio companies yeah. banked with SVB. And I think that that's not unusual. So uh, we've seen a, a action to protect deposits, which certainly uh, uh, pre uh, prevents uh, the kinds of immediate uh, a company can't make payroll uh, and, and literally uh, the company fails in, in a a very rapid uh, amount of time if it if it if it loses its its asset. So, so there's there's certainly that has been presumably settled. Uh, the other role that Silicon Valley Bank played was as a um, provider of debt facilities, and so that's a big open question. Uh, the UK hmm. branch of SVB has been purchased by HSBC, which is a large global a fairly conservative bank, uh, unlikely to offer the kinds of uh, debt facilities and build the kinds of relationships that SVB did um, in the U.S. We don't know how that's going to uh, uh, it, how that's going to evolve. What the new uh, what the new institutional home for uh, those accounts will be, and uh, um, wh where that uh, financing that debt financing is potentially going to come from. So absolutely consequential, not just to space, but the broader startup uh, community. And I, but I think this does shine a, a spotlight on some of the challenges of today's commercial space arena, which is uh, it has big benefits. Venture startups, big benefits. They move fast. They're they're innovative. We've seen a lot of them, and big challenges. And I think if I could just add, the space has never been simple. It's never been lacking in complexity or um, or surprises. But by adding other kinds of companies, I think there's a there's a new imperative for the government to become aware and understand and assess the environments that they're that the space sector is now encompassing. And uh, this user advisory group and others like it is is a little bit of our superpower in the United States. Most other countries don't have this kind of um, uh, vector in for space leadership on the commercial side to engage with space leadership inside uh, the the actual government. What what strikes me is that uh, the various sectors now are really coming. Uh, into play. I mean, the, the concentration on military space is heating up uh, in a in a major way, uh, and if there's going to be a reliance on the commercial side for that, 
uh, we were looking at Artemis as one of the mm-hmm. that the U, UAG uh, focused on, uh, and uh, you know where's that program going, and uh, what are going to be the mechanisms that uh, move it forward. Um, again, uh, that was a topic that was brought up um, specifically. What do we think about uh, where UAG can roll can play a role in uh, doing? the uh, Artemis program and seeing to it that it succeeds. Carissa? Uh, So uh, the Artemis program really is differentiated from uh, past uh, major uh, programs by its built-in commitment. And boy, do I wish Jim Bridenstine were here because he (laughs) helped build in that commitment to working with industry at all levels from um, uh, in, in providing opportunities for uh, commercial commercial payloads on uh, lunar missions, to uh, relying on seeking to leverage industry cap- uh, industry developed capabilities for uh, the um, uh, elements key elements of the architecture. Uh, so, what does the what is the benefit of the of the U- and, and uh, to incorporate international partners? Uh, uh, very, with a very broad, um, casting a very broad net. Uh, I, I think the UAG's benefit, uh, the, the opportunity for the UAG there is to um, continue to sort of have a supportive and engaged conversation around those commercial elements, uh, perhaps um, uh, provide a venue or a conduit, as Patricia said, provide access to leadership and build relationships that will help uh, to get over some of the hurdles that we will inevitably see through such an innovative approach. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bob, you also mentioned national security space. And uh, there, I think that 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 um, that access to, I like Patricia's note of, you know, the UAG is potentially a, a, a U.S. superpower because of that, you know, o- open engagement with industry in this way. I think that that's a, an interesting note. And from a national security space standpoint, um, building understanding on both sides, uh, particularly uh, with the non-traditional space community, uh, I think is a, a, a potential benefit of uh, of the UAG. It does seem like uh, the role of this uh, subcommittee they put together on exploration and discovery uh, does seem to have a mandate to look at things like public-private partnerships. Um, there's no doubt that the public has to be involved in that particular program, but how do you bring the private sector uh, in to uh, enhance uh, the public uh, activities? Uh, Patricia? I was just thinking about that, too. I was, I was thinking more of it from the international context rather than the, um, the uh, you know, U.S. Uh, entree of, of, of new companies to the Artemis family. But uh, I think one of the most creative and interesting developments, the Artemis program, is that it's become a soft power kind of um, international diplomatic tool. And it has been quite successful in that regard. And I don't think we've seen anything that's been quite so um, uh, coordinated and and potentially welcomed um, for for decades. Um, It will be interesting if we are truly trying to um, uh, expand the trade channels with, uh, with Artemis Partners to have this UAG group and its uh, frontline expertise at trade aspects that have been maybe more colored by national security concerns or certainly informed by a more adversarial formulaic interaction with industry. This gives a possibility to say, this is what we would like to be able to do with our near partners, our near allies. And this is the perhaps outmoded um, uh, structure that we need to fight through to be able to make that uh, relationship work. And I think that's a really interesting possibility here is to do get that kind of um, feedback to the government in a holistic way instead of through formulaic, um, and, and as I say, sometimes uh, adversarial inter- interventions on uh, hot topics for, for international trade in space. So what do we what do we think about uh, what's going to make all of these subcommittees effective in bringing things to the Space Council that then spread their way 
out across the rest of the government with all the government agencies that are involved. Um, Patricia? I, I think one of the first questions is you have to, this is a, a wildly talented group that could study all kinds of things. So the selection of what to focus on, I think um, is, it's really important to align that with um, actionable topics that are um, already in somewhat of a pipeline of deliberation. Um, and that is informing that outcome as opposed to teeing it up. There's just not enough time in this cycle, I think, um, to, uh, to take a, a topic from a dead start. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is it has to be um, a, uh, an industry or commercial perspective that can be reasonably captured in government policy. Uh, you know, there are lots of things that industry would wish for that are not um, easily achievable in a policy uh, you know, horse trading context. And so it needs to be something that, that's accomplishable. Um, the one sticking point I see in this all is that you know, the National Space Council is missing one of the most active aspects of government in terms of interacting with commercial space players, which is the FCC. They don't report to the White House. They report to Congress. They are not on the National Space Council. And so decisions about those tens of thousands of LEO constellations and whether they should deorbit faster or all those kinds of things are outside of this, this circle. And that needs to be healed beyond the, um, the organizational question about who, which agency gets the right to regulate what kind of new, new innovative service. Chris, what, what thoughts do you have on this? I mean, it, it strikes me that uh, Patricia's just raised an interesting point because it's not only that we have all of these uh, satellite constellations that are going up there, but now the, the threat of uh, debris uh, has uh, really uh, forced itself into the uh, uh, thinking of the space community. And it seems to me will have to be addressed uh, in the course of, this, uh, of, the, of the Space Council. What is the value of, of the UAG, of particularly with regard to raising issues? I think the reality is so this is a, this is a user group. Uh, we are halfway through this administration. The benefit of the UAG is not going to be to surface issues that have not been surfaced before, fundamental issues. And, and in fact, uh, just as in the previous administration, the Space Council is a, there's a pretty sophisticated, capable staff at the Space Council. So they're, they're, I think there are not uh, major issues missing from the agenda. So the, the benefit of the UAG is to uh, facilitate communication, potentially uh, eradicate some roadblocks that are arising due to uh, a lack of uh, interaction, lack of a forum for discussion, that I think is the benefit. Uh, certainly, I think the FCC point is a really interesting one in terms of, the, hey, we get some benefit here by improving communication. And Bob, I was just you know thinking, what would, thinking about major programs with international participation, Artemis is so different because it's so broad and so commercial, but of course, space station, the International Space Station was a soft power program with international participation with a very uh, um, rough history in terms of relationships with international partners, in terms of relationships between NASA and Congress uh, and, and industry players. And I wonder whether something like a UAG might have smoothed out some of those bumps. You, you uh, may, may be less optimistic about that than I am, but uh, I, I, I think that it's not gonna hurt and it could help would be my bottom line. Well, no, I, again, I think that's a good point because sometimes there are business relationships uh, that uh, go beyond the governmental relationships and yet uh, have a, a cross-pollination uh, potential. And so that could very well be uh, something that uh, we see uh, as a part of the future in all of this. Well, let's go back to Thomas, who I think may have a... Uh, a closing round question for us. So great discussion. Uh, and as always, one final question before we close. Um, I, I heard a lot of optimism, but also a bit of caution. General Lyles mentioned that there's some great expertise on the newly created UAG subcommittees. 
I heard the panel agree, but then I heard you somewhat caution that we need to be realistic in what we may be actually, uh, what we may, may be able to actually achieve. So what are your thoughts on how much influence and impact we can expect from the UAG over the next year? A year where we've already started with a legislative budget season and a year that potentially ends with the political campaign cycle. So um, if we could, Patricia, let's start with you. Thank you. I Thanks, Thomas. I think uh, as we identified, it's really got to be some topics that are already slightly brewing uh, for the UAG to have uh, an inject. Uh, and that, to my mind, in, in, in my world, that includes topics like um, orbital debris and space traffic management and how to make that uh, a, a reasonable whole of government approach. Um, I think it also uh, addresses this, this question of uh, mission author authorization, how to knit together many different corners of government that have a, a hand in some way or another on space policy, space licensing, space enforcement. Um, those two for me are um, already in the works and the in impact that the UAG could have, um, I think is, is meaningful. Um, I, I also really like the idea of this group looking at uh, the uh, effect of the Artemis Accords on their international business and how that might uh, bring to light some topics that, that maybe won't get done in, in, in this uh, the next two years, but could tee those longer term projects up uh, in a pipeline. So that, that's where I see some, some real advantage. Carissa, your thoughts? With regard to um, climate change, the UAG may be uh, a, have a significant impact in increasing awareness of the relevance of space to uh, understanding and managing uh, climate change and severe weather. And that is valuable in terms of the ability to uh, fund uh, programs and seek to address those challenges. With regard to national security space, that uh, the UAG as a venue for relationship building may be valuable because uh, there's still a big uh, disconnect between the national security community and the commercial community. Uh, and uh, again, you know, to sort of emphasize the point, this is an advisory group and uh, working on a relatively short timeline. So uh, I, I think we accept those benefits and recognize that uh, there are um, problems and challenges that are just not amenable to being addressed by this kind of uh, uh, entity. And I would just add, I think Chris's first point in, in particular to pick up on that, um, there is a, a, a pretty amazing list of government agencies in the National Space Council. And many of them are not uh, typical when you think of who's involved in space. I think one of the other impacts that the user advisory group can can uh, play is to emphasize the impact of space in corners of government and in our economy and in our da daily life that hasn't really been internalized uh, officially yet. So I think that is, uh, that's another great inject from the UAG potentially. Uh, there was that Harvard Business Review article that said every company needs a space strategy. Mm -hmm. Maybe every government agency needs a space strategy. Okay. Here, here. <laughs> And Bob, what about you? You've been through these cycles. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I couldn't agree more with uh, the, the last couple of comments there, because remember, this UAG is a part of the National Space Council, and it's the Space Council uh, coordination that is the important aspect of having it uh, chaired by the vice president and mm -hmm. being a part of the basically the White House uh, policymaking mechanism. So um, my concern is that the Space Council itself has not been as active as it, as it has been in the past. They used to hold quarterly meetings. The vice president would chair, and as a result, the various agencies would send in their top people. It was those meetings that really resulted in those people coming to the Space Council meetings prepared by their staffs in their agencies that made the Space Council a very uh, hardworking part of the overall space mission. So um, uh, I think that uh, we will have an effective UAG program if we have an effective Space Council program. Mm -hmm. 
all good insights and uh, appreciate those. And as always, I want to thank you, uh, all of you on the panel for your participation. And it just occurred to me the next time we see you, uh, you'll be in front of a live audience at Space Symposium Mountain, Colorado Springs. So I look forward to seeing you there. Well, that'll be fun. That'll be great. And as always, I want to thank uh, all of you uh, watching for joining us on our series, uh, Symposium 365 for Space Matters, and hope you as well join us in Colorado Springs on April 17th for our live show. See you next time because Space Matters.